Okay. Welcome, everybody. Happy Thursday. My name is Eddie Copeland. Uh, I want to welcome you personally to the Backstage webinar, a project of resilientchurchleadership.com. A uh, special welcome to you if you're here for the first time and you may be wondering, what in the world have I stumbled on? Uh, I promise you this is not just another leadership development podcast or how to lead your church uh, in a better or more healthier way. This is where we actually peel back the layers of what it means to be in pastoral ministry and pastoral leadership and look at the backstage realities of our lives and ministries uh, here at resilientchurchleadership.com certainly on this backstage webinar we believe that healthy leaders lead healthy churches and healthy churches change the fabric of our cities and so it's just a privilege to host this conversation week in week out like i said my name is eddie copeland i'm coming to you from south florida uh here from the offices of the national christian foundation where i lead a city movement called church united we have just seen god move in tremendous ways Ways as we focus on soul care and caring for pastors and ministry leaders below the waterline. Uh, today, I'm joined by three dear friends. One is a South Florida pastor himself, uh, Reverend John Lash, lead pastor of the Greenhouse Church in South Florida. Uh, I got Mindy Calaguire with us, dear friend. She is the founder and leader of soulcare.com and also serves as an executive at Glue. Some of you are well familiar with Glue, powering a lot of our technology uh, platforms, a lot of our churches. And then my dear, dear friend, the right reverend, Jimmy Dodd, uh, the leader of Pastor Serve, author of a few books on pastoral care and resiliency and how to care uh, for your lives as pastors and ministry leaders. So welcome, friends. Let's have have a good get dear deer. I feel like I'm in first place already. Double Come on. deer. Wow. Yeah, you gotta get double deer, deer, deer. No, this is great. Uh, this is perfect because what, what we're gonna talk about today is won't you be my neighbor? How to make friends as a pastor. And let's just talk about this right out the gate, friends. Um, it's hard to have friends, close friends, and be in pastoral ministry. I think so often you feel like I have a million and a half acquaintances, but the list of people who actually know me, if I have anyone at all in my life, is maybe one, two people at best. Um, Jimmy, let's just start this conversation with you. Many pastors uh, assume they have friends. Uh, how are you defining friendship and how common is it for pastors as you work with them to actually have true friends? Yeah, that, yeah, that's a great question because I think that to uh, meet with a bunch of uh, your friends, but all you talk about is sports or you know, TV or gossip or whatever it might be, uh, those might be your sports friends or your TV friends or your book club friends, but those aren't friends because with friends, you have at least some spiritual conversations. With friends, there is some point in which you talk about your backstage a little bit and you talk about your walk with Jesus. There, there have got to be spiritual conversations and friendships. And friends are those that you're close enough with that they can call you out and then they're still your friend afterwards. It's good. Jimmy, though, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to gently challenge something real quick because one of the things that I've heard a lot in, uh, with pastor friends, with ministry leaders is like, oh, I have, I have a ton of friends. But they're, they're describing the types of people that you just said. They're, they're buddies that I just, you know, I'm on a text chain with a bunch of sports stuff with. Or, yeah, I see them once in a while for a cigar or something like that. But they're not people that we're actually letting into our lives, into our backstages. And I believe uh, uh, we, we were talking just, just a little bit ago, uh, a lot of our seminaries have taught, some even actively teaching today, that if you're going into the pastoral ministry, you can't be friends with someone within a 50 mile radius of your church, right? That 50 mile rule, like you can have a ton of acquaintances, but don't really let anybody in if they live that close, because you never know that could come back to bite you in the butt. Is that, is that something that you see? Yeah, you know, yes, 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 I hear that all the time. And because there might be some kids on, I will not use the words I want to use. I will just say that's that's crazy. That's just crazy. Because that will just mean that you're isolated. That just means that you won't have any friends and you'll live an isolated life. And listen, there's always a risk in friendship. Always. Mm, there's good. always that risk that, you know, you might have a friend that all of a sudden does not want to be your friend and they want to talk about you and all sorts. And there's always a risk, but to say 
don't have friends is craziness, which leads pastors into deep isolation, which leads to massive issues, including depression to anxiety. I could go on and on. Uh, so I would say that that's crazy talk. And I'm sorry that we've ever heard that from anybody. No, I think it's straight crazy. There would be other words that we could use. I, I totally agree. It's, it's like pastors are self-isolating themselves because we've propagated this lie. We've propagated this idea that if you're going to be vulnerable, it's going to cost you something. And, and friends, if you're listening to this, I just, I, I just want to challenge you to say, take the risk. The risk is worth it. And some yeah. of your best pastoral teaching, best pastoral ministry comes when you are vulnerable from the pulpit, when you are vulnerable with your friends, because the evidence of God's grace in your life just gets manifested more and more and gets put on display more and more. But Mindy, you've you've written a, a bunch of books, actually, a couple of books on spiritual friendships, and we're going to post those on our website here at resilientchurchleadership.com. But I'm just curious, like, before I ask you, like, how you define spiritual friendship, like, what what caused you to go down this path and say, like, you know what, I, I want to write about spiritual friendship. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I would love to talk about that. I, part of it was you, you know, I've talked here before about my own sort of soul on health, and then in the context of ministry and the recovery process. And for me, as I was recovering the health, uh, or as God was reinvigorating the health of my soul there were certain uh, new practices or, or familiar things that I knew were ways that God would breathe new life into my soul. We all know that prayer is an important way and maybe I needed to learn new ways of prayer, but um, that was a thing I was doing to be intentional about the care of my soul and ways of engaging in scripture that were new or fresh or times of solitude that were new, right? But one of the things that I sort of accidentally discovered was that the crash that I went through forced me into a level of vulnerability with the people who were already around me, who, uh, that, who we just started journeying together in a much different way. Like all the pretense was gone. My life was quite obviously a mess. And so there were new ways to talk about that. But I couldn't get away from the fact that as I was building these different ways of relating with these friends, um, that it was a becoming a primary way that God was reshaping who I am at the core of my being. And I was realizing that this was an important dimension of my own spiritual formation of how I was being healed and shaped and transformed and called into what was new and next. And so for me, the relationships and intentionality around a way of relating became one of the core pillars of soul care, like one of the most foundational ways that I believe are important for us to embrace if we're going to live from soul health and experience the transformation that God has available to all of us. So that's how I ended up, um, you know, building that yeah. out as an area of, of work because it was coming out of my own, my own life and, and experience. And I will say that that quote about the 50 mile radius thing I was teaching about spiritual friendship to uh, one of the groups that was at Willow Creek. I don't remember. It was a it was a leadership event of some kind. We had a day long session talking about the care of the soul for leaders. And at that environment, uh, during a break where I had just finished doing an entire session only on spiritual friendship for people in ministry, a, a pastor came up to me during the break and he said, "Everything you were just talking about is exactly what I have experienced." He said, mm -hmm. "I." I went into ministry. That was exactly what I was taught in seminary. Do not be friends with anyone in your congregation. And he said, I, I, I did that because I thought that was the right thing. And he said, predictably, a certain number of years in, I just, it all fell apart. And he, he, he hadn't done some like major moral collapse. He wasn't embezzling money from the church. He just burned out. He could not mm -hmm. keep up with the, the demands. And he said, after he left and engaged in the season of healing, he said something, um, I, I have never forgotten what he said. He said, Mindy, it occurs to me that we are telling ourselves and each other that in order to be effective in ministry, we need to live a lie. In order to be effective in ministry, you need to be a false person to people and in, in your congregation, in your community. And that just struck me to the core because it's so easily like identified things we would all bristle at the thought that 
to be effective in ministry, you have to live a lie. But that is sort of the conclusion that you have to come to if you say, I can't be authentic with anyone in a 50 mile zone. And so um, anyway, that that's what the impetus for me on writing these things has been. It's really emerged out of my own story, my deep theological conviction that transformation is happening in the context of relationships that are marked by certain dynamics. And so anyway, that's why that's why it's no, it's a no, it's helpful. It's mine. good. So let's get John in uh, on this yeah, conversation. Yeah, yeah. John, you're uh, you're an on the ground pastor here in South Florida. You're pastoring a, a growing, flourishing church. Uh, you're finding some success in ministry, and I'm just I'm curious. Like, are, are these themes resonating with you? Like, mm -hmm. has there been a time in your life where you like, man, like it's been hard to find friends? Are you are you hearing these themes amongst your pep, pastor friends here? I'm just I'm just curious how how you're interacting with a lot of this. Sure. Well, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a joy and an honor to be with you guys. Uh, I've written zero books. So there's my contribution to the table right there. Um, <laughs> I am a, a church planter and um, you know, I, it, it's kind of mind blowing to me, Mindy and, and Jimmy hearing you share and Eddie hearing you sort of reverberate that. I, I, I really don't have a schema for the pastors can't have other friends. And maybe that's because I came from out of left field. I'm from a Jewish background. So mm -hmm. I didn't know any of this stuff. Cause I'm a Jew. I'm like, I didn't know any of the rules. <laughs> So I just did what was logical. And then I'm like, well, that's interesting. I, I don't know what I'm doing. So I need help. Really? I mean, that's what it came out of. And, um, and so I went, I went up to Gainesville, God's favorite college town, go Gators. It's not the point of the interview, but it's, you got to put it out there. And um, I went up there, I went up there and, and got mentored and got discipled and, and was really had spiritual coaches and, and deep relationships and, and men in my life that were helping to develop me and disciple me. And so um, when I moved back down to South Florida, which is where I'm from originally, not following Jesus at all when I lived here the first time, um, it just felt that was the normative next step for me. And, um, and so I, I was invited by a friend um, to, a, to a prayer group with a bunch of other pastors and, uh, and showed up and, and got involved in that. And um, yeah, and, and that just kind of marked me. So I, I can tell you, I mean, for anyone listening, and maybe you have heard in this context, oh, you can't have other friends or 50 mile radius, any of this craziness. I can tell you conclusively, if not for deep friendships and relationships, I would not be pastoring anymore. Yep. If not for deep yeah. friendships and relationships that where, we can, where there is vulnerability, where there is transparency, where there is an, an honesty and an acceptance of like, hey, man, I'm just going to kind of be raw. And, and I need you to encourage me in ways. And I need you to call me out in other ways when I, when yeah. I need to be called on the carpet on stuff. Um, th there's no chance. I mean, I would have been done year one. The average church plant typically dies out. I mean, overwhelmingly dies out in the first year. I'm like, oh yeah, I, I 100%. We would have been one of those statistics if not for the grace of God and deep friendship. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I, I don't have a, 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 you know, I don't have a, a book on it. I can tell you it is a functioning reality of my life. I'm a practitioner for sure. Um, and it's a game changer. Nice. Yeah. You know what John when John's talking about and we're and we're going to talk about this a little bit later on in the show is the whole movement of Church United like the things that we're seeing God do in South Florida and unity and collaborative mission are being birthed out of friendship and it took pastors coming to I'm going to say just coming to the end of themselves coming to the end of I, I have to have this all figured out or my tribe or my denomination is going to go change the spiritual landscape of South Florida alone. Like we had to first become friends before we could stack hands for collaborative ministry. And John came down in such a sweet time where God was putting that in so many leaders hearts. And it's just, John, I'm just so encouraged to hear that. Like that hasn't been your experience here in South Florida. Uh, but I can tell you, and I mean, like I, I've written zero books, but I did write a master's thesis on spiritual abuse and disillusionment evangelical church and i and i can tell you that this is a reality loneliness of pastors and the isolation and the like if you really knew who i was if you really knew what i struggle with and mindy you made a great point like this isn't like some crazy moral failure piece this isn't like i'm hiding some big nasty secret sin it's like i'll just be honest like i, I was redoing my baseboards the other day right and i cut it wrong and I, I didn't know my windows were open and my neighbor was outside barbecue. And I was like, son of a, you know, blank. And I was so, I was just so mad because now I had to go back Eddie. to Lowe's and get more. 
and and I just realized like, oh no, my windows are open. And so I go out there and my neighbor's like, ah, I heard that. And I was like, you know, pastors are people too, man. Like what, what can I tell you? My buddy wrote a book about that, Jimmy Dodd. But, but really like just even the freedom to go like, I don't have to sit in that shame. I don't have to hide. Like I was wrong to use a not so nice word, yes. But like, it doesn't have to condemn me. I don't feel like I've got to be something I'm not in that moment. And, and friends, like, I'm just telling you, that's not the reality for so many pastors. So Jimmy, uh, why do you think, I mean, you're having these conversations day in, day out, your team across the country is doing this. Why are friendships so difficult in pastoral ministry? Yeah, let me just say, uh, for, first of all, I think that we should probably change this from the backstage to counseling with Eddie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That might just for counseling act- for Eddie. Actually, counseling for Eddie. Yeah. Eddie. Yeah, I'm just putting it out there, guys, to to to, to the whole world. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, like it's one of those things that I have sh- shared this over and over again, but I think I just have to say this one more time because I think it's practical. Is that Satan has a small toolbox? It's a tiny toolbox. He's not omnipresent. He's not omniscient. He can't read your mind. He doesn't know your prayers. All those things that we often th- th- think he does. He, he is a very small toolbox. His primary tool is he whispers lies. And oftentimes we just believe those lies. And his main lies are, don't be honest with anybody because if they really knew you, they would not like you. Don't share your secrets with anybody. Keep your secrets, keep everything very, very close. And, and it's that's that's such a lie. And I think the pastors have, I think that we have just gotten to a point that we just believe that. And we think I can't have any friends because I can't be honest with any friends. Because if I was, if I was completely honest, they wouldn't like me. That's a lie from Satan. Uh, Because it is the most freeing thing in the world to have friends. And you can share all sorts of things like Eddie shares with us pretty much every week. And we're still friends with Eddie. We still like him. (laughs) We know all sorts of things about Eddie, even things he hasn't shared. I mean, like on this broadcast, we know him and we still like him. Don't believe those lies because that's that's a primary tool of Satan. And we just get convinced, man, you know what? Because because we have that huge fear. If I share myself with you and you actually reject me, I, I feel like dirt. If you accept me and love me, but I've not shared myself with you, I feel, man, I feel like a fraud. But the thing that we long for and dream of is, man, I just want to have friends that really, really know me and really love me. That's possible. That's possible. It's a risk. It's always a risk, but that is very possible. Do not believe the lies of the devil. It's good. You know, Jimmy, I, I feel prompted to share this. And this is this is the God's honest. Here we truth. go. Here we go. My it, point is it, that- No, no, no. Uh, here we go. So uh, Jimmy is a, it, is a close friend of mine. Uh, Jimmy actually helped me in friendship get comfortable with a story that Satan whispered in my ear for so many years uh, in shame and in hiding. Uh, And when I told him this, like, it's really simple. I did not graduate from high school. I dropped out of high school because I was chasing the girl who became my wife. And let's just say got really creative about the next step of my future. Moody, thank you so much for understanding. And the list could go on. Uh, But listen, uh, I struggled with this lie of you're stupid, you're a college, you're a high school dropout, you have a GED, because I was love struck, okay, it was stupid, it had nothing to do with academics, I was chasing the love of my life, and I'm like sharing this story with Jimmy, and Jimmy just starts laughing, like I'm pouring my heart out, I was in your kitchen, and you just start cracking up, and I'm like, why is he laughing, and he goes, that's the greatest thing I've ever heard, and I'm like, but in this moment, Like you just freed me from the shame and this guilt. And like God used a friend in this moment to say, you can come out of isolation to this one thing in your life. And I just share that because like that story is just a microcosm of like what friendship can do, what spiritual friendship can do. The thing that I was hiding from, the thing that Satan was just whispering in my ear, you're laughing, you're just like, like, that's so stupid. That's the greatest thing I've ever heard. And then Jimmy goes on to tell Everybody at Pastor served this story the next day. And I'm going, I guess I'm going to get comfortable with this real quick. My gosh, it was on Twitter in five minutes. It was quick. Yeah. 
<laughs> no, but I mean, I, I, I share that to say, Mindy, like the, the, what you're talking about, about spiritual friendship, like uh, God used Jimmy in that moment in my life. Um, but I'm curious, like, as you wrote about spiritual friendship, like this, does my story or a story like that, like, does that resonate with like what those friendships yeah. can look like? Yeah, absolutely. And that's how they can be so deeply transformational, setting us free from that deception that we might have uh, knowingly or unknowingly uh, succumbed to. Uh, one of the things I love learning lately, you guys have heard me talk, we've had Jim Wilder, Dr. Jim Wilder on on backstage with us at resilientchurchleadership.com as well. Um, but one of the things I've learned from him and a few other sources is even at the level of our wiring in our brain, there is a big part of how we experience our identity in how other people mirror us. How they encounter us is how we start to understand ourselves. And at some level, we kind of may resist that because we're thinking, no, my identity is all in Christ. And all of that is true. But even there, we look to Jesus. We see how he and God, how God sees us and we form our identity. We anchor there, right? Mm -hmm. But it's through these friendships, if we let ourselves be known, that we can then begin to see new things mirrored in the lives of our friends who see us as generous or kind or creative or hardworking or any number of things that for whatever reason we are blinded to. So often, you know, one of the ways you, you deepen a spiritual friendship is this idea of mirroring where you help someone see, I mean, we're all blind. We, we all have blind spots. We, you know, the reason you need a mirror in the morning to put your contact lenses in or anything else is you just can't, we can't see ourselves. And we need loving mirrors. And usually when we talk about that's a term in psychology settings and all that, or in, in counseling settings, we think about or immediately are, are worried about like, what's the, what's the terrible thing about me that somebody's gonna hold up that mirror and I have to face that truth. And certainly that can be the case, but in my experience, so often um, the mirrors that we hold up to one another are also like what Jimmy held up to you that day. I remember when you told me that story and I was out at dinner with you and your wife and I was dumbfounded. I had never heard such a story and it, it's just delightful. And I, I remember I was making jokes about like having new, new, new ways of thinking about Eddie once I understood that and a few other parts of your story because you seem like such a mild mannered, you know, she logical called me guy. An accountant. Guys, she said I looked like an accountant. Okay, that's what that's what she's not sharing with you right now. You you look like you're you're sneaky in all of your ways of being completely unconventional because you show up looking like an accountant, but you're actually got this radical kingdom agenda. But not but the Ben Affleck accountant. Let's just be clear. What's that? What, what'd you say? But not the Ben Affleck accountant. Let's just be clear. <laughs> My wife would disagree. <laughs> see there you go and i would you would move across the country for a wife that disagrees like that that's exactly that's exactly okay so anyway oh. we've we we have the the privilege of holding up mirrors Ooh. to our friends all of us go through this life with broken identity broken mm -hmm. understanding of who we are what we're capable of and when we hold up a mirror not of flattery or, or weird, you know, self-driven stuff, but when we hold up a mirror to someone else and say, do you see how God used you in that circumstance? When we help someone see what they can't see, and to me, this is one of the big blessings of, of spiritual friendships is that we, it, it helps us on our journey of becoming who God's forming us to be in his image and with our unique fingerprints of our story and our personality. So good. All right. So guys, we're, we're, we, we've obviously, I think we've painted a really good picture on like the need for spiritual friendship. I think a lot of people see that need. And I'm just like, as simple as this sounds, I think people struggle with the how, like, how do you get this? Like, how do you go from a place, I don't want to say from isolation into being known, but like, where do you even start to like have a friend as, mm -hmm. as a pastor to have one or two people in your life that you can journey through? And, and John, like, I'm just gonna, I, I'm gonna come back to, to you because I think part of your story 
is, is so simple on how this was found for you and yet profound. So can you just talk a little bit about like, how did you find a group of pastors that you really felt I can do life with? Like how, just, yeah. just walk, walk us through that. Yeah, I'd love, I'd love to unpack that. I think it's, it does start with an, a realization that I need it. You know, and I, I hope we've built a case for that here, the, the liberation that can come when you invite someone else in and that light permeates the darkness where the enemy of our soul likes to keep us, keep things hidden. And, and so for me, I came down um, and I really, it really started with a, an invite, a single invite. I got invited by, a, by another pastor to a prayer group. And so I went in and I've been a part of pastor prayer group stuff before. And, um, and oftentimes it's uh, pastors and spiritual leaders doing their best father God, humble brags like, oh Lord, we only have thousands of members, but help us. Do. I'm like, oh my God, you're not praying, you're bragging. Like, stop it, stop it, stop it. Let's be honest with what's happening, you know? But I went into this group, man, and it, it was a lot of church planners, but it, it was just, I mean, a bunch of pastors and ministry leaders just desperate for Jesus. And, and it did something in my heart. I'm like, okay, I could be here. Like, this is, this is a cool spot. And, and we worshiped together. We prayed together. There wasn't, there wasn't like any crazy fireworks or sparks. It was just very simple agenda, but it was heart level stuff. And I was like, okay, this is, this is cool. Um, I went to one meeting and I was like, you know what? I, I, I think this is something I need. I think this is something I want to be a part of. Um, and then I had another pastor from the group invite me out to lunch the next week. He said, hey, you're new in the area. Um, I, do you like tacos? I'm like, of course. Who doesn't? Heaven loves tacos. Who doesn't love tacos? You can't, you can't be a pastor and, and, not, and not like tacos. No, right? We're no, just going to say that right, right here. Is that a question? It's like, not is that a, a question? No. You know? So he's like, do you have tacos? I'm like, heaven, yes, I love tacos. He's like, all right, I got this great spot. It's a local spot. Why don't you come with me? You know, I want to take you to lunch. So I was like, all right, cool. So he took me to lunch and, um, and he just asked questions. We just ended up talking. He's like, Hey, so what's your story? How'd you come to know Jesus? What brought you to South Florida? What's your passion? And, and, and I totally felt, you know, mm. let's be honest, you know, so I didn't learn some of the things. One thing I picked up very quickly in ministry is people get territorial, but it's not everybody. And so he came, he took me to lunch and I realized I'm like, man, I, they really want me here. Like not only was that group awesome, these pastors are awesome. Like they want me to be a part of the team. Like they, I felt valued. I felt seen. I felt heard. And so it was literally a meeting and a lunch. And I was like, oh, I'm in. And then it took some intentionality with me and follow up. But, but to, sure. be, to be honest, after I had that initial invite, I'm like, man, that, that was so good. That was so helpful. I felt so honored. I want to do that for somebody else. Because so then the next pastor that was new that came to the group, guess we took him out to lunch. I did. I'm like, oh, here's my whole ministry budget for the month. I'm gonna, you know, church plan style, right? So <laughs> I'm gonna take you to lunch, you know? That's, good. How that's good. Um, and, and not the fancy taco place, the Taco Bell. No, 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's how exactly. we're rolling. Yeah, that's how we're rolling. But it, it wasn't, is it easy? No. Is it complicated? No, it's actually very simple. You know, hey, let's let, let let's park some some time there because I I so agree with this. It's like you found some spiritual friendship in your life because somebody picked up the phone and because you picked up the phone and called someone. I, I, I'll i stand before you like today saying like the first step in this is literally just shooting a text message or picking up the phone to another pastor in town that you may or may not know that well, right? Find another Christ following pastor, sit down and say, hey, I've been in ministry in this town for 30 years, or I just got here. And I realized like, I don't really know you at all. Like, I don't know why you came to this region. I don't know why you've stayed at this church. Like, tell me like, where are you seeing God moving? But here's the trick, right? Don't talk about your church. Don't talk about, oh man, this is what we're doing for Easter. This is what we're doing for Christmas. And everything's up and to the right. The church has no problems at all. My elders are the best. My board's the best. <laughs> we have no money problems. You know, my wife thinks I'm the greatest pastor in the world. Because guys, like, we, let's just be honest, like, we're in meetings like that all the time. But when you sit down for that first meeting, just talk about, like, how did you sense God's call in your life, right? Like, what brought you to choose this church rather than the church in Boise, Idaho or wherever, right? But just ask those kinds of questions and you will be shocked about where God shows up and how the Spirit moves in that. And we've just seen that over and over again here in, in our South Florida context. But I want to get to a question from a viewer real quick. And, and friends, just as a reminder, if you've got a question or want to hear anything more about anything that we've shared, uh, rather than my high school story, I'll be happy to answer those live on air. But no, um, this question comes from Sarah. She's one of our listeners. She says, I'm moving to a new state and new community to be the new pastor in town. 
Here's my question. Uh, is it my move to invite pastors to the new from the Newtown to connect with me, or do I wait for that invite first? I have a feeling it's my move. Uh, I'll give my answer, but then I want everybody else to, to, to chime in on this. I will say, if you wait for them, it may never happen. But if you make the move, it could be the spark that sparks other meetings with other pastors. Jimmy, Mindy, John? Yes, I completely agree. Yeah, I mean, like, make make that first move, take a risk. Uh, if, if I could be very uh, bold here, I would say, because you're a female pastor, you just have to know that there's some pastors that you might you push back. So I would call a Wesleyan or a Nazarene. Hey, that's a, smart. I like that. Or a PCUSA, or there's others I would call a pastor like with the Covenant Church, because you just want to start in a place that's going to be friendly, because there's other places you might call, and they might say, whoa, 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 I don't want anything to do with you if you're a female pastor. So I would say just, just be smart, and just know that there's lots of denominations lots of networks that are very, very open to female pastors. And I would start there just to make sure that you have a friendly voice on the other end. That's good. Mindy, would you add anything to that, John? Uh, my, my, I can, I can just share a little story. First of all, yeah, I agree. First of all, I love that you're thinking about it. And I would highly recommend that you initiate uh, with wisdom and, and don't put all the eggs in one basket. Like, maybe send out a couple emails and see who's willing to, to get together um, and, 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 and be willing to maybe have a couple of those first few meetings not turn into a great immediate friendship. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. But it's, it's seeking where is there that resonance? Where is there someone who you can uh, be authentic with? And, and we're all for you, we're cheering for you in that. But the story I was going to share is really quick. But um, when I was a pastor's wife, because often the spouse of a pastor is also a rough, uh, very isolating place to be in. And uh, I, we were in, in Boston at the time. And a, a woman called me up, I think, I don't even remember how we first met. But she had, she as well was a pastor's wife and had just moved into our area from uh, Texas, I believe. And she had had a really rough transition from their last church. Many of you may know what that can entail. And it was heartbreaking, disappointing, broke their hearts on a lot of levels. And so she came in to the new next church, very sort of guarded and understandably so. And she said that, f I think I met her maybe after she'd been in our area a year and that she had been praying for God to give her a ministry peer, somebody that was outside of her church, but was a, a peer who like Jimmy said, you know, has Jesus at the center of their life as well. Um, but who, who she could meet with, pray with, whatever. And she became, and is still a, a great friend. Um, but during that season, we really journeyed together very strongly. And I've always thought, what a great, what a great way to feel the pain. She had to do a lot of grieving for what had happened in the past, but she, she didn't let that pain stop her. And she knew she That's needed good. a peer. And so just to if, if you don't know who to email yet, if you don't know where to start, just to begin asking God to guide you in that next step, um, I think uh, he is eager to, to meet you in that request. And, and you may be very much the answer to someone else's prayer as you're good. moving in to that new city. So that's how I would answer the question. No, it's good. Jimmy, uh, I'm in your book... Um... I think it's survive or thrive you actually have a story about friendship and spiritual friendship in there yeah yeah you want to tell that yeah sure so um i mean like you, you know what i mean like it's just a great story so it's uh three very good good friends uh jack ron and chuck and uh they happen to be the three guys that sold the most books in actually like the last century so you probably know who they are right jack is come on guys you know Jack is C.S. Lewis, Ron is J.R.R. Tolkien, and Tolkien, yeah, yeah. Chuck is Charles Williams. 
And so the, these guys are just like the best of friends and they spend time together and they meet every Thursday night for like 16 years and they do do like the inklings and their readings and their books. And it's just that this amazing friendship. And then Williams dies very, very, very suddenly in 19, I think, I think like, like in 1945. And so then Lewis thinks, okay, I want to be actually with Tolkien now. So we're going to become much closer. We're going to become really, really good, good friends. And so he begins to spend a lot more time with Tolkien. And then he writes in The Four Loves. And it's just a great story that he tells. He says, it was strange because I began to spend more and more time with Tolkien and I knew him less and less. And he said, I couldn't figure it out because we were spending time together and sharing our lives. And I knew him less and less. And then it dawned on me that there were certain parts of his personality that only Chuck could actually pull out, that I couldn't pull him out. There were certain parts of his character that would just respond to Williams. Like he said, like, you know, there, there, was, there was always these really, really stupid jokes, I guess, you know, that would always be told. And he, he, would, and he said, and it was amazing because Tolkien would just laugh at Williams' jokes. And he said, I couldn't do that. And he said, I began to just actually understand, you know somebody best in a real community because certain people pull out certain aspects of their personality. And he said, if that's true of friendship, how much more so actually about God that I can know God better mm. as I have friends that are different from me. So if I have a black friend, if I have a Hispanic friend, if I have a friend who has cancer, if I have a friend who's Haitian, if I have a friend that, that might have made, maybe actually just lost a child, they're going to see God just a bit differently. If they're poor, what, 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 you know, I mean, we, we could just go on and on, but they will see God differently and that we can know God better in the context of friendship because different people pull out different aspects of God. And it's like, and so um, listen, I can say, I know God a lot better because of Mindy and Eddie because I spend time with them. I hear them talk about God in ways that I think, wow, that is refreshing. That's not the way I see it, but that is so refreshing. And now I can see this other aspect of God. So it's like this big diamond that constantly turns and there's all of these facets of this diamond. And so I can just more and more as That's I really spend good. time with people that are different from me. Now, listen, if I spend time with a bunch of white male suburban pastors, I might not see it. But as I spend time with those who are different from me, it's amazing how I begin to see God in just extremely unique ways. And I'm thinking, okay, I know God a lot better because of you. That's why friendship is so critical and not just friends, but some different friends, some friends that you might think, I don't, I don't know if I'd call that person because they're you know, not the same race. They're not the same age group. You know, you might think, I don't know if I want to call that older guy. That seems to be a little bit awkward, although I realize that that's me in a lot of contexts. But you know what, though? I mean, I mean, like, you just have to reach out to people. You don't look a day over 70. You look great, man. Thank you. you. Look so good. Eddie, can I, Eddie, can I jump in with that real quick? Come on, been absolutely. A lot, that, yeah, that's been a lot of my experience. I, I think, you know, if we're talking right now to pastors or potential pastors down the road, or maybe they're, they're, they've been doing it for 30 years or whatever the context might be, I think oftentimes, and, and Mindy mentioned something, we had a pre-call and we were talking through, okay, we're, you know, and, and she mentioned something. I'm like, man, that is so, that has been my experience. You know, when we think the church, we, we are, if we're not careful, we get so honed in that we think lowercase c, right? Our, our little unique slice of the pie. But a robust biblical theology commands us to think capital C church. And, and that's how Paul's writing in Corinthians and things like that. And so my experience has been as I journey and form deep friendships with pastors from other tribes, from other de denominational backgrounds, from other sects, they have a unique passion point, vantage point, aspect genius, if you will, of, of, of the way they see God, the character of God, the attributes of God and his spirit that enriches my understanding. I actually get better as a minister of the gospel. I get better as a pastor because of those friendships. And so for me, I came from a context where I had awesome mentors within our tribe. But I've been able to glean things from guys down here and, and gals down here, ministers down here that are not of our tribe that I didn't get even with those deep friendships. And so it's been so motivating for me to realize, man, if we can tap into the strength of the body, I mean, that's a gospel, Come on. right? That's what we believe. 
And, and yeah, it's on, you're like, well, I, I don't know what I think about that non-essential doctrine that we have differences. Like, okay, get over that because there's so much beauty there and the profundity of when every, Paul says, when every joint supplies what it's bringing to the table, then the body is strengthened and built up. And, and I think that's one of the beautiful aspects of deep friendship with people, not in our sect, not in our tribe, not in our denomination. It strengthens and mobilizes us for more robust mission. Let me let me just jump in right there and say, like, that is what we have, like, what John is saying. This is what we've experienced in South Florida. This is what we've experienced in the Church United movement. And friends, like, I don't care where you're watching this from, what denomination or tribe you're from. Uh, if you're watching this, you're probably praying with those people for God to move, for revival, for gospel movement, for gospel advancement. But let me just tell you this. Here's something we've learned. If you are, if that collaborative unity is not rooted in friendship, you will never view your friends and neighbors down the street as co-laborers. You will always view them as competition. So when you view gospel movement, when you view collaboration in the lens of connection, soul care, really doing life and finding friendship, now your capacity to collaborate for mission not only expands, you've got a category for it because listen – I'm a Presbyterian, John's not, but John's on mission, okay? Like, and that's the deal. Like, we have we have some differences in some non-asexual doctrines, but you know what? I don't care that he's wrong about the end time at all, okay? <laughs> but, like, I mean, we're, we're, we're joking. And listen, like, we don't hold these things, like baptism and end times and, like, all this stuff, guys. It's like, like, John loves Jesus, and John wants to see other people deployed on mission for jesus and you know what in a post-church post-christian environment our lost friends don't care about john's view of baptism our lost friends don't care about my view of baptism at all they assume we're united they assume we're friends so friend i'm telling you friendship in ministry especially with other ministers and pastors is essential for gospel advancement in your region and that's the strongest apologetic i can offer no that's good that's good i had a mentor at one point who said something I've always remembered um, about, about, about relationships in a ministry context. I think he was speaking more broadly even about all our relationships, but he said, never, never forget, never be deceived. Competition kills community. Mm. Competition kills community. Yep. And you, I mean, there can be a friendly little, you know, level of, how we talk about our sporting teams or whatever. But if I fundamentally see that if you go up, I've gone down, mm -hmm. we can never be friends. I can only, I can only experience real community if you going up makes me thrilled. If I am That's for good. you. And if you cannot fundamentally be for another person flying, even if it means your loss, if you cannot be for them, you don't have the ability to move into the kind of community and friendship that we're talking about here. And I, you know, I, women can be highly competitive with one another and they can be all looking like they're being friendly and self-disclosing and all the kinds of things that would speak to friendship, but you called it a humble brag. But I think there's versions of that that exist in communities of women, right? And where it can get really ugly. But I think the same kind of ugliness has existed in communities of ministry leaders. And it's just, it, it, it is just sad. Everyone loses. The, the body of Christ no. loses. The people involved lose. It's like a net loss for everyone if we can't move into a place of being for one another. And whatever work you need to do on your own, confession, healing, grieving, whatever it is for you to get to that point where you can begin with somebody. And I'm like, I actually want to be for that person. <laughs> I mm. want to be for that other pastor's success. And how can I, how can I take them out to lunch and be intensely curious about who they are and just leave it at that. Just care, yeah. just care. Like what would yeah. happen if you just cared about them? And, uh, and we can all smell when somebody is doesn't care and we sense there's a different agenda so i had a anyway i no, like no no as you were talking you know, like, no 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 at 
much much to that like i had a friend once say ego and logo kill spiritual friendship right and this and this same friend talked to me about he had been in ministry for 35 years and he said you know what pastors are really good at he says we're really being good at if i can do something screen we're really good at being vulnerable from from here i'm about six inches away from my heart from here out but where we really struggle is from here here that six inch gap between where like I'm, I'm vulnerable right up to here, but when it gets a little too close to home, I push it back and he goes, that six inches of vulnerability, a lack of vulnerability will kill you in pastoral ministry. Yeah, that's powerful. That's I think Mindy, I'm not, with me. Yeah, it's one of those things I'm not surprised that Mindy took this to like a much, much deeper level uh, because she's very good at that. But yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, like one, once you start to dig down, I think that you have to come to grips with that at times, I think for pastors, and listen, this was very true of me for a long time, was that there was jealousy. There was jealousy of this church is growing. Yeah, there's a lot pride. Than mine. The, you know, and everything seems to be a lot newer and just like a lot bigger. And listen, this is key. To be jealous of another pastor means this. They have more of your idol than you do. That's what it means to be jealous. They've got more of your idol than you do. And you need to just repent of that idol and lay it down because that's going to kill your friendships. And, and you know what? I think that jealousy kills a lot of pastoral friendships. And man, you have to lay it down and just say, gosh, that, that will absolutely crush my soul if I am jealous. I mean, and, and, and I'm like even worse if I'm envious. If it's like, I want their church and I don't want them to have theirs anymore. So mm -hmm. I, I, I just don't want to go up past them. I want them to go way down. There's, there's lots of envy. So it's like, oh man, they had a hard time with their church. I'm kind of glad. It's, it's like, oh man, how That'll small. preach. That'll preach. Have? It's like, man, you have to lay that down. That's an idol that you have to lay down because that will absolutely wither your heart. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you for me, I, I think that's, that is deeply honest and if we're if we're being honest in the recesses of our heart it, it is true to a certain degree well i'm just afraid of getting hurt amen you are but let's be a little more honest i just don't want to be their friend because then i'll have to root for them mm -hmm. now we're getting somewhere That's so, so I'll, I'll tell you i'll tell you what i do as someone it seems like eddie bears his soul so i'll bear my soul as someone <laughs> that that, that, okay, that go ahead, shame go ahead, John. It's done. you go 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 you know? so so as 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 someone as as a human right I'm a, I'm a pastor but i'm just a human as a human who does struggle with insecurity which if it goes dark you know i'm an achiever enneagram whatever i'm an achiever so so if i go dark it can it can be envy and jealousy i actually utilize intentional effort on my part to build friendships with other pastors as a proactive combative to my dark side because i'm like it's not so i'm not waiting to say okay if i can get rid of my envy and jealousy then i can be a real friend and then i can care i'm like i'll never do that that's a gospel i can't do that what can i do i can say you know what i'm gonna actively and intentionally become friends with other pastors because when i'm friends with them i now i'm telling my soul how to feel i'm like no get out of here foolish shit. i'm gonna they're my friend i care about them and now all of a sudden it, it's almost like a life hack for for the dark sides of us that are trying to take over, you know, it, it, for me, it's like, it, if I start with friendship, the, the natural end game of that will be a celebration for a kingdom win. If I'm oh, waiting that's... around for friendship, it's not, it might not ever happen. And so that's, that, I mean, that's honestly one of my end games. It's like, I do it because, and a byproduct is I've ended up thriving as a result of it. Cause go figure God said in his word, that's actually what we need. Who would have thought, you know? But for me, it's like, this, this is a way, this is a way, not just for unity, this is a way that my soul stays healthy and I can continue to grow as a disciple and, and not be overrun by the dark side of my own carnality. Good yeah, stuff, John. Really good. good. Come on. Yeah. I'm Man. glad you haven't wasted time writing books. I'm glad you're out there preaching. This is a good thing. Good. <laughs> John, I want to be yes, that's really good. So I would like to make actually a big, big announcement. John, you're my new best friend and Eddie, you're out. So I just... <laughs> That was, my hope. that was my you hope all the, along. You kept extending that rent-a-friend contract. Thank God I'm done with it. <laughs> no, guys, listen, we're, we're, we're about at the point in the show where I'll go around and I'll, I'll ask each of our guests to give me a final word 
on the topic of the day. So uh, final word on friendship, and I'm going to do some out of order. I'm going to start. Um, my final word on this topic is we try to always leave you with something practical to like go and do or something you can go put in place. Here it is. For me this week, I want you to get on Google, Google the name of a church in your area that you don't know the pastor and just literally call and say, I am pastor so-and-so from this such and such church in your neighborhood. And I just want to get lunch or coffee with you and hear your story. That's what I want you to do. Awesome. John. I'm going. Right. Oh. Oh, go Mindy, go. I was going to go I next because I just want to take that challenge uh, to go. the to whatever other roles you have. Whoever's watching, whoever's engaging with us, you might not be the senior pastor, and you might be in a, a leadership role in a church that's volunteer. You might be in any number of things, but for the sake of the body of Christ do exactly what Eddie just said with whatever seems like a peer to you. Is it someone in a parachurch organization? You guys both lead campus ministries at the same college campus. You know, there's a competition there. Maybe you're both youth pastors and there's competition between that. Maybe it's you're both women's ministry pastors or you're, it's a business relationship. You're an elder in your church and you have a, a, a brother or sister in so Christ good. that you know leads a competitive business. What does it mean to pick up that phone and call someone? Uh, so, and maybe even as we're talking, God's just putting somebody on your heart. Uh, just figure out who that is. And they may not have time for it. They may not receive it. And that's okay. It's not about what they choose to do. It's you taking some steps of obedience to move towards. And who knows what God may do as a result of it. That's good. Mindy, as usual, you take my idea and make it 10 times better. Oh, so stop. That's no, why I don't, all, this, this is, is why it. I don't chime in. So good. So good. No, I'm right. dead serious. That was so good. Let me, John, let me, go. Pick, let me piggyback on that because I don't want to give you more than one ask. I'm going to keep building on that ask. When you, when you make that invitation, humility begets humility and vulnerability begets vulnerability. Someone has to start it. When you, when you have that meeting, share one thing that's hard. Share one thing that's hard. We all, have, I use the term humble brag. I use it tongue in cheek. We all do that. Let's just, we all do that. We all have the temptation. What do you want? Your first impression to suck with somebody? No, you want them to think you're amazing. It's, it's who we are, right? But, but commit in advance. Be like, you know what? Mm. I, I'm going to share one thing that, that's hard. One thing that I'm struggling with. One thing that, that I'd love some encouragement about. One thing that I'd love some prayer about. And you will find that out of that vulnerability, you actually help that person lean into that relationship. So that's what I'll add. Amen. That's so good. Jimmy, don't disappoint us. Build on wow. pressure. Bring yeah. it home. Yeah. No, no. So, your final word, man. On so I, I would say it. it's just extremely important for you to have two to three really, really deep friendships that those guys are like your Nathans. And I say guys, I don't mean just men. I mean, also women, but they're, you know, that they, you know, that they are the ones that you have, you basically deputized. And you, you've just said, hey, listen, you know what? I know I have some blind spots. I know that there, there are some things I just can't see. I need you to be a close enough friend. When you see things in me that I can't see, you've got to point them out to me. So, I mean, like if I'm in like a restaurant and I'm real, real, you know, and if I'm like extremely friendly and you're, you're like, you know, dude, you kind of crossed a line from being friendly to kind of flirting. And I don't think that you can see it, but I just need to kind of, be the one to say it. I mean, like you have to have friends like that. You have to have friends. You, I mean, like you just have to have Nathans in your life that can help you see your blind spots because we all have them. We all have them. And so you just have to have really, really close friends and just trust them with that. Say, man, you know what? It's going to hurt sometimes, but I need you to speak truth to me. That's so good. Great words, great words, friends. Listen, all the resources that we've talked about, uh, Mindy's book, Jimmy's book, uh, anything else that we have mentioned that you can go read if you want to take just a little bit of a deeper dive in this topic. All those resources are parked on our website at resilientchurchleadership.com. I just want to say thank you for tuning in with us uh, on this Thursday. We do this every week. We just have a conversation uh, about being, uh, what does it look like to invest in our backstage rather than our front 
stage because Lord knows there's so much stuff to, that tells us how to be a bigger, better, stronger leader and grow our churches. And that stuff's exhausting, if we're honest. But each week we just create an hour uh, to look at the backstage of our lives, invest in our character, invest in the things that nourish our souls. Because at the end of the day, healthy leaders lead healthy churches and healthy churches change the fabric of their city. So we'll be with you next Thursday, two o'clock Eastern time here at the backstage. We'll see you then.